Welcome to the diecast, everybody. This week I'm here with Ross Sevenhausen. Did I butcher your last name? No, actually, you, I think you got it right, which is astounding. That is astounding. Uh, and Ross, we, Ross worked on Watch Dogs Legion, which is out now. I've been playing it. I'm two thirds of the way through my second playthrough. We're going to talk about the game this week. I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions. And, but this is not the first time we've met. We have worked together in the past. We worked on Good Robot together. So he's both friend and colleague and a game developer that we can ask questions to. So ideal. Welcome, Ross. Hello. Also a fellow Unity dev. Oh, you're into Unity too? I did not know that. Yeah. That's what my new project's based on. Oh, that's right. You asked me a question on Unity about a month ago and I said I'd get back to you and I didn't. I'm a bad friend. Well, it's like I ask those questions and then I normally find the answer right after. It's like Google's lying to me, but yeah. Right. Anyway, I solved uh, it. It's fine. We're good. 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 Uh, yeah, I've also been doing Unity Dev, but I've been doing VR Unity Dev. And I have Ooh. all those kinds of questions too. Just what, how do you do this? And you Google for it and none of the results are relevant to you. And it's impossible yeah, and you'll never find something it. something bizarre. And then it's like, either after you do it or you're almost about to give up, there's always the one where you're like, hang on, actually. And you find it, you know, at the bottom of a comment thread buried. It's like three years old. Right. So, Ross, congratulations for one thing. Uh, you shipped a triple A game. You were on yeah. a triple A. I mean, that's congratulations. Even if the game was terrible, that's just, that's a big deal. But this game seems to be doing really well. So you have a successful triple A game under your belt. So congrats again. Yeah, it took a while. Also, it getting hired at all in the AAA industry was hard. Right. So, uh, how long did you work on this game? Uh, three and a half years now, I think. And you came in, it, the game was already well in development when you joined the team, right? It was kind of, yeah, I would say early, mid development. Like, uh, and... I, I came in, oh, sorry, I go on. Well, in the credits, you're credited as level designer. I honestly, knowing your skill set, I honestly had no idea how they were going to credit you or what sort of, what your job title was, because you have a lot of skills. Obviously, you're a programmer, you do art, you do scripting, and you you know a lot more about like game design and mechanics than I do. So you could literally have any title. But you have the title of level designer, but that doesn't tell us anything because this is an open world game. So, like, what does that even mean? What did you do? What can we blame it, you for? Level designer is almost like a hilarious misnomer because I've never actually built a 3D space. I'm really more of a mission designer. So a lot of what I did in the game was the recruit missions, uh, a good number of those. So when you recruit a random person, the, the trouble they have that they give you. Um, the systemic missions like that. Uh, some of my favorites were the revenge missions. I worked on them as well. And that's when you take off a Londoner particularly badly and uh, they act against you. I think they can kidnap your operatives. I don't quote me on that, but a bunch of things that they can do. And that starts its own mission. I've, I've never, I've had uh, team members kidnapped before. Um, I thought that was scripted to always happen within the game, but I've never like pissed off anybody that I know of. That targeted yeah, us if you, um, that. I think if you if you really annoy one person, uh, like beyond their starting level, if you do things to them specifically, like if you keep hitting them with a bus or something, um, over and over, <laughs> when they come back and they recover, this guy again, god damn it, they'll uh, <laughs> they'll develop a grudge and they might actually that might trigger a mission. Uh, it was a while ago that I worked on that, but those are some of my favorites because they're the most systemic. It's like, you know, I would. Just things that they do, like, uh, you know, sending gangs of people to attack you or kidnap people or uh, things like that. And that could happen in the open world, so you might be in the middle of something else. So, I haven't messed with... I played the game... For those who, who aren't following this game, open world city game based in London. Um, so, you might want to call it a Grand Theft Auto clone, except it's really not. You... 
the whole premise of the game is that you're a resistance group and you can record you can recruit anybody you meet around the open world and have them join the resistance you have to do a quest but you know every civilian has a little list of of perks or bonuses or special abilities or downsides and you know you just hunt in the crowd for like really talented people that you need then you do a quest to get them on your team. They've all got their own face and voice and, and everything. But then you run around and shoot things. This game encourages encourages non-lethal. Um, it's actually a, it's actually a little ambiguous when it's you're being lethal and when you're not. But yeah, there's there's like injury states that are not strictly lethal but look pretty bad. Like, right. You know, I fell off a bridge. <laughs> right. Well, the one that confuses me is I've got a hitman on my team. Now, maybe that's my fault for having a hitman on my team. Like, that's his day job, is assassin. But when I go to do a takedown, takedown is normally non-lethal. They, they get knocked out. But he does it by garroting you with piano wire. And I'm, I'm just thinking maybe that's a little... That's going to be hard to that's walk out. fairly off. lethal. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think some of them anyway, use guns as well. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, and so I've been playing the game very straight laced. You know, non lethal, quiet, trying to do as much stealth as possible. The game even like tells you, I don't know if there's any systemic response to this, but the game at the beginning, the characters are like, you know, remember, we're a resistance group. We're supposed to be helping people. Sort of saying to the player, look, don't steal a bus and run everybody over. Don't run around blowing up cars. Yeah, it's hard to prevent players from looking like, uh, you know, crazy, violent people. Because it's the most fun thing to do in most of these games, to be perfectly honest, right? It's the most systemic right. interaction you can have with a big crowd of people and cars going by. Well, they explode. If they explode, why right. do not make them explode? How fun is that? Right. So today I realized I hadn't done any of that. So like this would have been eight hours ago. I just uh, ran around the... Oh, one of my operatives got injured. You can have them get injured, killed, or arrested. And one of my operatives got injured for 45 minutes. And so... and. He's the one I really wanted to use. It was the big final mission, and I wanted to go. I wanted to go in and shoot everybody, and it was my hitman. So I'm like, I don't have anything to do with for, for 45 minutes. So I'm gonna dick around with the open world, and see what I can do. And I went around griefing policemen and and just causing all sorts of shenanigans. And I probably blew up an awful lot of cars, and you know, did a lot of chase scenes, and ran over a lot of pedestrian so i might actually get to experience a lot of your content soon i probably yeah. made some enemies another thing i've been working on uh it will it's just future content mostly for the online modes so there's a lot more of my stuff in there actually than probably uh is left over in in single play though i don't know if you would want to play online or not yeah i i haven't touched the online stuff yet so I'm having a blast with this game, but there are also a lot of weird, like, you know, you you play, this happens all the time. You're playing a video in your game and you've like come ac across a situation and you're like, why did they do that? Why did they do that? Um, so he here's a question I have for you. Uh, you know, there's kind of, t as a player, it looks like there are three pillars to the gameplay here. It. You know, I see hacking. Hacking is thematically the core of this series. Um, stealth and combat. And to drive home what hacking... I don't want people to think like... Um, in Deus Ex style hacking, where you just walk up to a machine and just hack it and it gives you money or plot point or a plot coupon or whatever. This is more like you can complete a mission that takes place with a building without setting foot inside. You walk up to the front of the building, stand in front of it, get out your smartphone, and hack a camera, which gives you access to another camera, and you sort of chain through the building, and that gives you access to a spider robot, which you can use to crawl through a vent, to activate a server, or to, you know, unlock a different door so that you can get the spider bot into another room, or you can get to a different camera and solve a puzzle to 
you know, download a bunch of crap from somebody and then walk away from the building having never set foot inside. Or you can run in the front door and shoot everybody. I mean, that's that works too. So I see it as the three pillars, but I might be missing anything. But my question is, is this how you thought of it, like three pillars? And was there... Was the intent to make all paths viable, or was it more like we want these missions to be more hack focused and these to be more combat? Or like, what was the thinking there? I think a lot of it goes by location. Uh, I, I think most locations are supposed to support those other three pillars. By the way, like definitely that was the general intention. Um, and it's interesting that every like location kind of leans one way or the other, but doesn't deny the other ones. Like. Personally speaking, when I play video games, I like more bespoke experiences that have um, more of a designed goal. Like, I'd rather play a, a mission in a location that's very sneaky as one beat, and then have another one that's combat heavy and have, like, have to struggle to do the other ways. Because if I have to work really hard to sneak through a mission, as long as it's not super frustrating, it's interesting to break the game that way to me, um, versus having a thing that's just sort of a, an all-rounder that's okay at all three. But uh, I think the general idea was that every location should at least support all three pillars. But it could, and that's not by mission. I think it's it's by space, by like, you know, what things are in the environment. Um, but they do have like preferences. So some places are more easy to be stealthed. Other ones, it's you know, there are no like stealth options are limited, so it's easier to shoot your way in. And I think uh, hacking is also one. Though I think a lot of things can be interacted with by hacking, so it's a little easier. Yeah, I got to the end of the game, and that was definitely... I mean, I, I assume it was intended to be all combat because I couldn't figure out any... I was kind of like, wow, I am shooting a lot of guys. Maybe I'm supposed to be hacking. You know, they just keep coming, and I'm like, oh, I'm probably being the idiot player who just, like, goes and go. Oh, there's probably some hacking way around this, and I'm doing this the stupid way, but I couldn't find it. So I'm assuming at the end of the game, it was like, all right, end of the game time, shoot everybody. Yeah, I wonder if they want it to go faster that way. Like yeah, more you know, action pace. Yeah, I mean, that that is appropriate for the end of the game. It, it would be kind of weird if it's like the big final confrontation is you stand in front of the bad guy's lair and play with your cell phone for half an hour. Yeah, only to be hit by a bus or something somewhere when you're not lucky. <laughs> I love those messages where you're like, you hack a camera to get to a drone, then you fly the drone to pick up a thing, and you're flying around the base, and then it's like, uh, you get to see, it, you finally notice the message. Your operators, your operator is being attacked, and you go by and you're surrounded back to by so three. many strange things. <laughs> right. And I've got like three guards punching the crap out of me, and I didn't notice because I was so engrossed in my cell phone hacking. I literally came back to an angry hobo suplexing me once. I had uh, I had winged him with the car on the way in, and then he he tracked me down eventually. It was like two minutes later, and I was, I was like, "Wait, I'm taking damage," and I went back, and it was mid suplex. That's amazing. You can get really engrossed in that hacking, I guess. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of Tribes, actually, a uh, Star Siege Tribes, where you could um, go into the command layer. This is a multiplayer game, by the way, and you could like control cameras and turrets uh, just by clicking on them on the mini map. And you, while doing that, you didn't see your body, and it was a capture the flag game. So you could come back to find that you were literally a corpse, and you never even noticed. <laughs> you didn't notice you died because you were so involved. Right, exactly. So um, one of the storylines, my favorite storyline in the game, I, I don't know what internally what they were called. I've been calling it Daybreak. It's it's a storyline involving a character uploading their consciousness. To a computer to become immortal and i was like this is good that was really good i really enjoy it i could have stood a lot more of it i i think it's the shortest in the game yeah it's my favorite uh of the four whatever uh main like story beats right there's like uh, it's it's the ubisoft design where you run around capturing towers they're not towers in this game but you run around freeing individual burrows you just you know one thing i didn't have this here in my notes of questions to ask you but i really appreciated 
is there's the open there's the scripted content you have in order to free this burrow you first have to liberate this guy but there's also the emergent stuff or the auto generated stuff which like to recruit somebody they want you to go to random building and you know get some information for them and the game doesn't make any effort to keep those separate so you can be in the middle of doing one and like walk through the room and you're like oh there's a guy I got to rescue and just free him on your way through and i've had locations where i got to do like basically three quests in the same building and the game was yeah. fun with it i just that made me so happy it made me feel like it was actually emergent and not just lots and lots of scripts yeah, there's a, there's a lot of emergent uh, casting, I guess it's, it's called, to send missions to different places like that. And they can overlap as long as there's an open uh, space for whatever the thing you're trying to do is, you know. Yeah, there's some places that have a lot of jail cells. And I'm like, wow, there are like six or eight cells in this building, but there's never more than one prisoner. And I'm like, is it possible to come here and like have three different quests to free people at the same time? And just, <laughs> just tearing free one another across them. <laughs> right. Or you've got to like escort them all out. Also, props to you. Um, this is the first time I haven't absolutely hated um, escorting somebody to safety. It just seemed, it wasn't even a thing to worry about. You do escort them, but they don't seem to get themselves in much trouble or blunder into traps or get lost or stuck. They just, you know, follow you out and they're okay. And then they run off. Yeah, those missions, uh, I find it interesting that they, they could do parkour, they can climb over stuff, they can, uh, I think they get into vehicles as well, if you get into them. I haven't tried that. Oh, man. But then by the time you have access to a vehicle, you're near, the quest ends as soon as you get into a public space. So mm -hmm. it's like not often you would get in a vehicle while you're still trespassing. Yeah, I was always worried about them blundering into traps or, or doing setting off security systems, but they never did. They just followed me out. And you take it for granted, except so many other games have failed so hard. I mean, it seems trivial to the player. You're like, well, of course, he's just got to follow me around. How hard could it be? But you know, we've <laughs> yeah. seen dozens of other games where it's apparently super hard. The ones that always annoy me the most are actually um, the World of Warcraft escort quests where the person would walk. They wouldn't run. They, they'd slowly amble away from the, the imminent danger that you just freed them from on like a scripted right. path. And it was even worse because they would, along the way they would stop and they would be like, Hark, I'm being attacked. And you're like, I don't, I don't see anything. And then it would spawn in like 15 mobs that would then surround them and attack you. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, was there was so none annoying. of that. There was none of that nonsense. I I wonder now, are are the people you liberate invisible to your enemies? Do you happen to know? Uh, they I think never... they're. I think they're like a. There's a priority waiting. I'm not. Don't quote me on this again. I'm. I'm just speaking from player level intuition but it feels like they are like a lower priority they're like civilian right because i've had them like i take the good spot and cover and they crouch nearby and i'm like oh crap you're gonna get spotted but you know i can't like oh, get into cover idiot there just wasn't any i was hogging all the good cover but i'm right. the player and i'm the most important person so obviously but they didn't get spotted and i'm like all right is that does, I mean, I'm not going to, this is not a complaint. If somebody from the <laughs> developing the game hears this, this is not a complaint. Please don't make me get caught because an NPC can't find cover. I'm just curious what caused this. I know they do, um, if you like notice carefully, they actually pay attention to different things. Like, like there's no like general alert state. They'll they'll see you or see something else. So if, if they can actually end up spotting um, like other factions or things like drones or things like that and not associate them directly with you right away, and they can be alerted by those and focus on those things if you're still hidden. I have noticed that where I'll come up to a building and they're like, oh, the target's escaped or we can't find the target. And it's obvious they're all in this agitated alert state and walking around with their weapons out and some 
probably some NPC wandered in. Yeah. And pissed them all off. And that's, you know, that's really interesting. Also, a hilarious moment, I went to this place and I realized, you know what, this, this building seems more hackable. I kind of don't want to shoot my way through the building. And I was currently with my secret agent, this little old lady that, you know, is a retired secret agent. And she she's she's a little weird because she sounds 80, she looks 40, and she moves like she's 20. And <laughs> It's a good combination. Yeah, yeah. She's really powerful, but she's like, oh, dearie. So she's a lot of fun, but she's also, confusingly enough, the character I go to when I want to kill lots of people. Um, and I was like, I kind of don't want to go in here and murder everybody. I'll switch to my, my stealthy character. And I love that the game does this. You switch to one of your other characters, and it doesn't put you on the other side of the map. It just pretends that, hey, this person you wanted to switch to just happens to be one block away. And that's really nice. So I get my stealth. I couldn't get in the front door. The front door was locked and the key was inside. So it was like to get in this place, I needed to hack something to get the door open. So I couldn't get in with my secret agent. So she's standing there at the front door, switched to my hacker, jog all the way back to, you know, one block away to this mission as this other character. And when I get there, I see my secret agent that I abandoned walk in the front door, even though she couldn't open it when I was controlling her. And just start wandering around inside the base, and nobody freaks out. Oh, that's very interesting, actually. <laughs> <laughs> right? And she's like, she's not going real deep into the place. She's just hanging out kind of in the parking lot. But I'm like, what are you doing in here? And how'd you get the door open? <laughs> and I kind of wanted to, I really, really wanted to see if she got noticed, if she would just start plowing through the place. But um, then I just did the mission because she was just hanging out at the edge of the car park and I didn't see any way to, to conduct a clean test of what would happen. Like I couldn't push her. Yeah, that, that reminds me of oh, one of my favorite stories where we were testing one of these recruitment missions and it was going really well and the director was were there in the room playing and um the they did the recruitment mission they started with the, i forget who it was they they had their problem and uh, then they walked off to do their own thing and so the director started driving a car to go to the location to for your guy's friend say to uh, you know to get his loyalty and right. having a lot of fun driving through the open world you know going over a thing taking a jump turning a corner and he he looks over and goes, "Hey, that's the guy that I'm doing the recruitment mission for." Hey, buddy, and the car hits the curb, flips over, and pastes him against the wall. Mission failed. No, no. And they had to start over. I did find out it was you, practically can... leading out. Oh, sorry, go. Ahead. I I did find out you can uh, you can murder some you can murder somebody you're doing a quest for. I tried to recruit a paramedic and I walked up to him and he was like, yeah, I'm really not interested in talking right now. I'm like, well, screw you then. So I blew him away. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is it. Like I said earlier today, when I started experimenting with all the insane stuff that I hadn't touched yet, just acting like a, a crazy person and the game recognized, okay, this guy is dead. And then I saw somebody that was like a relative of his and didn't like me because I killed him. And I'm like, wow, there's a lot going on in this game. Yeah, they can uh, they can end up dead for other reasons, too. Um, as long as they're on, on screen, they can end up like falling off of stuff um, or, or say being uh, attacked by factions that hate them. Very interesting. Yeah, I don't mean to say that'll happen elsewhere. Uh, generally, I think it has to be in your your cone of uh, vision. Your you know nearby. Right, part of the simulation, but it even does things like uh, members of your team. You can recruit them, and they have lovers or significant others, partners. Uh, they have brothers and sisters, and you can just run into people that's like, 
hey, this person is the brother of your drone expert. And I'm like, that's really cool. Have you ever seen two of them share fashion? No. I remember seeing a brother and sister with really loud pants that really stood out. And I was like, hang on, why do they have the same really, really gauche pants? And <laughs> it ended up that they were <laughs> relatives. And I was like, oh, I guess that makes sense. You inherited your parents' terrible taste. Anyway, back to the Daybreak storyline. Daybreak is somebody uploading their conscience, consciousness to a computer. My absolute favorite part of the game, I just played it through played through it earlier today, and I was like, this is really good. And um, at the end, it presents you with a choice. I'm not going to spoil it, but you know, you can do one of two radically different things here. And it's the only part of the whole game where it presents to you a classic, like, here's, you're having an RPG choice moment, TM. Um, so, was that an experiment, or was that something, like, were there going to be more of those? I guess you can't talk about cut content, but can you discuss anything about this choice and why it's the only one in the game? Uh, I won't say too much, but I know the guy who worked on it worked on the new Deus Ex, so that does explain the three-way choice or two-way choice that kind of it's was presented two. there it was two and he's he's a pretty cool guy <laughs> um other than that i think i'm not sure uh it's it's one of the harder things to pitch for a mission because it goes outside the scope of a mission right the, the lasting impact right. is touching other parts of the game which is usually other departments so there's a lot more involved in getting something like that approved so I'm, I'm really just guessing, but I think that's probably one of the reasons you don't see games with more uh, lasting binary choices in games made by large studios, because they have to call in other people to kind of weigh in on that decision that would normally just be within the, you know, the group that's making that one bit of content. Yeah, okay, well that explains a lot, because there's, um, if you make the choice the game kind of wants you to make, the one you've been building up to, then everything goes as planned. But if you do the sort of renegade choice, the game basically says, whoa, you did something amazing, and then never brings it up again, and there are no consequences beyond that. And I'm always like, I was kind of like, I did the, the renegade thing earlier today, and I was like, oh, I was kind of hoping for a little more reaction than that. But that explains why it basically had to present a choice, but it couldn't reach out beyond. I actually thought I was going to lose access to the, to one of my allies, and it would be replaced with with this former enemy. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. But no, that didn't happen. My former ally just, like, continued to be my ally, but was mad at me momentarily. And the bad guy poofed away. Right. Uh, so that wasn't like... That wasn't like the game was going to be, oh, it's going to have all these RPG choices. This isn't like a new direction for the series. It was just a little experiment, I guess is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of times pitches will start out being ambitious like that as well. And, you know, these sorts of things sort of, you know, uh, shrink the scope of them, right? Right. They kind of get worn down. Everybody's like, well, if you do that, then that creates work for me. So I don't want to do this. So you go around... <laughs> Talking to all the right. people on the team, and pretty soon you can't do anything. And, and the more people that are involved, the the more that kind of stuff gets in the way. Which is, I can, I think, kind of the big difference between like a big AAA team and a like a, a small indie team, where it was like it was just us and Arvind. It was easy to just talk about a feature, and then in, in that same conversation, be like, "Yeah, we could do that or not." So yeah, um, I mean, we've both worked on indie, but I've never worked on AAA. Can you compare? I mean, obviously, these are radically different. But just, just like, talk about working at those two. Because you're doing both at once right now. You've got the indie yep. stuff you're doing on the side, and then your day job is working at Ubisoft. And, like, yep. talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, it is super nice to actually get paid on a regular basis. That was the big problem with indie, of course. Um, you're reliant right. on your games to sell and you know they don't always sell that well they can get vanished in the the sea of steam and just disappear <laughs> like right. uh, or, or they could end up with with weird metacritic uh, results i'm thank you guys so much by the way for really liking good robot because its metacritic scores are incredible 
<laughs> right. I think we're, we were at nine point ninety eight out of a hundred on Steam. Uh, Steam for a good while. I don't think it's a ninety eight of a, out of a hundred, but I really appreciate everybody that gave us a thumbs up. Yeah, it was interesting. Like unrest is nowhere near that, but unrest has a lot of articles that talk about how interesting unrest is. So it's kind of like right. a give and take. Right, and so a lot of people checked it out, and then it just wasn't for them. Where this game was just people who are into my, <laughs> who I think, are into my. Yeah, it might be that. Yeah, but it's yeah, it's interesting. Um, obviously, for for indie stuff, it's super nice being able to just decide your own features and have a, a small team that's reactive and can work on stuff, you know, right away and doesn't have to worry about anything else. Um, you know, you're obviously restricted by your budget and who who you bring on and what you can do but you know with in that scope you can do whatever you like so it's kind of liberating right um triple a is usually more you know here we want three missions of this type or something like that and then you have a little bit of creator freedom right it's like you know i'm feeling a little creative today and i want to do something and then you're like all right well here are the people you need to talk to convince that you get to be creative today <laughs> right you and... to get them all to sign off yeah, and, and things like, you know, oh, we can't actually do this in the game right now, so we'll have to ask a programmer and see if we can get someone to support developing this part of the game, you know, things like that. Right. Versus, you know, hey, Arvind, can we do this? <laughs> right. You know, in Good Robot, it was almost like we were paralyzed with choice. We could do anything. Yeah. I mean, we were all over the place talking about, like... Oh, we, you can unlock different robots, and they'll each have different abilities, and level them up, and, I mean, there was, there were a lot of different designs being thrown around there, where in a yeah. AAA space, you know, you, <laughs> hey, we could make a totally different kind of game, is not something that comes right. up in meetings, eh? Yeah, and I'll, another thing I noticed also is that, like, decisions being sort of segmented all across different departments and different levels of responsibility and so on kind of the uh, the features people like the most like the almost average person would like the most are the ones that live the longest going through that chain of like approval and the ones that are radical tend to get their edges sanded down or just lopped off as they go because it has to appeal to each level of approval you know Right. So it's it's difficult to sell particularly radical features. Like I'm sure it was a hard time um getting the like, oh yeah, you could play as any NPC. People would, what that's, that's crazy. What do you mean? Any you, you know. Right. That that's that's the magic feature. Oh, speaking of this, I really I have to know this. But I I'm afraid you're going to spoil the illusion I have and disappointment, but I need to know. Are the are the NPCs in this game a fixed pool, like you generated a thousand people, or are they randomly generated? As far as I know, they're randomly generated um, oh, with, yes. with a bunch of weighted, you know, buckets. Uh, and I know, I know, it right. starts at the location you find them. So it's not like it just has an infinite memory of people. It, it'll be more like, are you in right. like a poor district? Then we want twenty yeah. percent beggars. We want thirty percent, you know like tweakers we want 50 percent random pedestrians that kind of okay that's awesome that is really after a while i started worrying maybe because i started seeing the brother sister relationships or the boyfriend you know running into the girlfriend of one of my other right of one of my other team members and i was like wow this is really in depth this has to be handcrafted and that would kind of disappointed me. But since it's really randomly generated, that makes me happy. So let me tell you about my favorite NPC. I'm running around. It's the middle of the night. And I don't even know what I'm doing. Just, oh, I was more running around getting collectibles. And um, I, come up, I come across this guy, Howard the Beatboxing Au Pair. So, he his day job is that he's an au pair. But his, his evidently his dream is to be a beatboxer. And he was really going for it. 
empty parking lot facing a brick wall. There's like puddles everywhere. It's this filthy parking lot. Nobody else around. And Howard is absolutely going for it. Just this mad beatboxing set he's doing right here for no one in particular. And it's about midnight. And I'm like, man, that, you know, you probably just got off work, just got the kids to bed as an au pair. And now you're just going to come out here to your parking lot and chase your dream <laughs> of being a beatboxer. And I just, I just sat there and silently laughed for like 30 seconds at, I'd listened to his performance and it made me so happy. I think that has a systemic effect too. Doesn't it draw crap? If you do it in public. Uh, it probably would, but he was like nowhere. There were no right. people. It's the middle of the night in the middle of a parking lot, so it's not like he would pick That's up street awesome. traffic. <laughs> right? And he's facing a brick wall and just really going for it. And I seriously, I loved him so much I thought of I thought of recruiting him. But then, you know, I can't leave the kids behind like that. You gotta think of how the kids would feel. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to give up his passion for, for dead sec? Right, exactly. That wouldn't be fair to the kids. I have a list of funny recruits, if you want to hear them. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I found three with just great appearances. I found literally Waldo. He had the toque on. He had the striped shirt. He had a mustache <laughs> for some reason. And he had the round glasses. <laughs> and he was a poet. And I was like, why is Waldo here? <laughs> And then he went, he ended up on my team. So now whenever I test the game, you know, just, just going through missions and whatever, suddenly I spawn as Waldo. And I was like, I didn't even, okay, I guess I'm Waldo. <laughs> but wait, oh, that, that should give you some stealth bonuses. Like nobody right, you just hide in the crowd. <laughs> right. I also had, and this one was really weird, a guy with face piercings that were all spikes. And he looked like he was just Hellraiser and he was a drone expert. <laughs> And his drone was all <laughs> jagged too, and I was like, okay. I do notice the drone, like, I wonder if there's some, there's some guidance behind it. Like, secret agents are always older folks who wear nice suits. Yeah. You know, I haven't found a secret agent that's like a young kid with a mohawk. Yeah, I think they, they come with restrictions on like things like that but so there's still a random pool but it's just like they have to be this age range they have to be you know this fashion type things like that um my favorite character is just this i mean it's it's emergent she's just broken by accident um she's just like a regularly randomly generated npc that just has this killer combo of features she has the ability to shock people which okay that's that's fairly, I mean, that's a little bit rare, is just the ability to deliver a shock to anybody. But then she also gets this disrupt ability, which I think comes from your tech tree. So she can shock people twice, and one of them takes half their health, and the other one just stuns them. But those two together mean she's my most effective, um, aggressive operator, even though she's supposed to be a hacker. That's all her skills are like, you know, hacking keys at unlimited range and super fast downloads. But her, this weird combination of shock abilities means she plows through people faster than the hitman. So anyway, like so, so some characters seem to seem to be pre-made. Like there's the hitman seems to have these couple of abilities, and then a random an open slot where they can have something random, but they always have like these two or three things. That's how it seems to work to me. Mm. That is exactly how it works. Oh, is it? Yeah. There uh I believe if they have a there are like tiers of um bespokeness, I guess, that they come with in that you can find Hitman, they always have their hitman moves and then they'll have an extra slot for something more personal that's based on their profile. Right. And sometimes it can be something stupid. I mean, there are, there are negatives that, and maybe they uh, hit You can wind up with a hitman. That's a negative. Like, uh, there's, there's one that like, they just spend money. There's, you can be a gambler and just waste money on gambling. Sometimes you can compulsively buy hiccups, flatulence, um, I forget. There's something about it, the shopaholic 
one, I assume they spend your money on clothes. I think so. And they'll just generate clothes. Right. So you have this massive list of clothes you'll never wear. Um, speaking of clothes, uh, you can dress up all your operatives however you want, but they have their auto-generated outfit. And when you're hanging around the base, they're always in their auto-generated outfit, their original outfits before you've got a hold of them. And this is always one of my great disappointments is I'll dress someone up. Okay, you're my medical person, so you wear all green. And you're a crazy person, so you're wearing all pink. And you know what? You're really cool. I'm going to put you in a suit. And I, you know, deck everybody out so that I know who they are. But then I get to my base and I'm like, who are these people? Because <laughs> they're wearing, you right. know, their original clothes. Is that, is that a technical limitation or was that a design choice? Was, do you know anything about that? I'm not really sure, except that I know that they have a sense of outfits. So if you have a medic and they're on the job, they'll wear their medic scrubs. But if they're not on the job, they'll have their casual outfit. So I wonder if it doesn't have something to do with that. Yeah, that maybe they just auto switch back to their default outfit. Because, yeah, the... Yeah, they switch back to their net. It's, it is kind of funny. Like, I can't recognize them without the clothes that I put on them. And I wondered, I guess I really wondered if it was, can you only have one customized person at a time? Because it's like, the person you control is always wearing mm -hmm. the customized outfit you gave them. But when you run into one of the others, in the they're open often world too, Actually, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. That could be interesting. Because I've, I've never actually seen... I don't do the clothing uh, configuration too much, of course, because I just play the game in, in little spurts, right? So right. I never get to see a highly customized character that I made for long. Um, one of the things people complained about in this game, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but everybody is like, oh, the repeated missions. This is like the fourth time I've had to go to this location and rescue somebody. Because, you know, it's it's auto-generated, so... You know, mm -hmm. I try to recruit somebody. He's like, go to this location and rescue somebody. Or go to this location and blow up a thing. Or go to this location and hack a computer. And that almost never happened to me. It's uh, it's always, like, been something different. Every And like I said, I'm two-thirds of the way through my second playthrough. And, you know, I think my first playthrough was, like, 40 hours. And I don't know how many I this playthrough. I wonder if it's because, like, certain locations are like very memorable or if it's because uh players tend to hang around in the same places in certain styles of playing maybe because oh, i know like you may not want a mission that's 3000 meters away right so right. there's probably a waiting on what's closest to you and then that's also filtered through by what can be set where so if you have to you know stop a kidnapping it has to have a place for someone to be kidnapped and maybe the only ones within a certain distance are like these two or three specific buildings. Right. I tend to be all over the map. So maybe that saves me from that. Maybe I get some of the rarer location. Although I do notice the one Kelly location comes up a lot, but it gets used for very different things. Sometimes I'm there to hack a computer and sometimes I'm there to um, steal a van, but it's kind of in the middle of the city, I think. Uh, is it the Thornsfelts warehouse or something? Or is it the... Uh... I can't remember the name. I remember the there's layout, a... but that doesn't help us. There's an Assassin's Creed Unity reference somewhere in there. Yeah, this is a very small location. It's a... Uh, you know, some of them are really... That, that's another interesting question is they vary so much in size. Like this one Kelly location I'm talking about is basically one open parking area with a couple of turrets in the middle. And possibly a, a generated van that you need to steal. Right. And and just that's surrounded by guards, but that's basically the entire location, a couple of rooms. And then other places are like, you know, a five story building or something absolutely crazy like that with multiple puzzles and security systems and just layers and layers where you can go in through the roof or through the basement. Or go in on ground level if you like shooting people, you know, and then yeah. other places are, are really small. Is the size choice, was that, 
was that intentional or you just wanted a variety or or what was that i think i think per per borough there's almost a budget i don't actually know about this for sure you know don't quote me on that but it feels like the place that you go there's probably more uh like i would say enforced variety but you know here's like three larges two mediums one small things like that uh right it, it, maybe it's not that granular it's just probably some overlap but uh I know, for instance, in the very bottom left of the map was my favorite location, uh, Brixton Barrier Block. It's enormous. It has like, it's like a uh, an apartment block uh, split in two, almost like, it looks like Toronto City Hall a bit in that they're in a half circle and they wrap around, it's almost like a shanty town in the middle. And the place is huge. And like, there are so many places to have gameplay just inside that one space that it could almost be its own map in like, you know, a shooter or something similar. Right, right. Yeah, so London is freaking huge in this game. I mean, it's, you know, open world city game with a really big city because it's supposed... It feels like... No, I've never been to London, but it feels like it copies London the way the most recent Spider-Man copied Manhattan. It's not literally one-to-one -one scale, but for a video game space, it feels right. Like, if you actually built a real place to real scale, it would be too much. It would take forever to drive to everywhere. And this hits that magical sweet spot of, like, it feels absolutely enormous, but it's not just so big that you never learn it. Yeah, I, I, I kind of enjoy also how if you go in a straight line, you can almost notice the neighborhood changing. It goes from, like, yeah. downtown to, you know, the suburbs. So one of the things is, this has been one of my gripes with Watch Dogs Legion since the beginning is that it feels like it should be a cyberpunk game. And it feels like a cyberpunk story set in a very, in a very mundane modern world. And it occurred to me that's even, you know, it's, it's hard to pull off the cyberpunk aesthetic in a realistic city. You know, you kind of need those mm -hmm. giant smothering city blocks of, you know, mega tall buildings with hardly any windows. Yeah, and the big neon uh, signs and the pipes right. coming out of the sides of the building. And it seems like it was, it would be super, if there is any non-cyberpunk city, like if you ask me to name the most un-cyberpunk cities. What? The least cyberpunk city. Right, the least cyberpunk city. I mean, that would be like London would be near the top of that list. It's just a very, it looks like an old town. You know, it, it has that old European feel, which is just the opposite. Uh, cyberpunk, I think, has a strong Asian flavor to it. So, like, mm. was this something that you had to deal with? Did anybody, like, we need to figure out how to make this as cyberpunk as possible? <laughs> Well, still keep it was, recognized with London. There was for sure a cyberpunkening that went on. Like, at one stage, it was almost, you know, one to one London, and it was interesting to watch it become more and more cyberpunk. Yeah. I liked the cyberpunk flavor, and I always want more. Like, the first game was like, what, what am I doing here? This is not cyberpunk at all. I found the first game super bland. London, th this is much better, but I I could still use more cowbell. I could still use more yeah. cyberpunk. I mean, personally, I'm, I'm the same way. I think, like, the more out there and interesting, especially an open world game world can be, the more I'll probably like it. If it's something, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to think of, like, a great example. Oh, I know. Like, Twinson's Odyssey. I don't know if anybody's played this game, but they made a world that was completely strange. And, like, from the transportation to the uh, the people that lived there, there it wasn't even just humans, um, to, the, like, the architecture, things like that. And those are always really interesting to me. And if, if a game had an ecosystem like that, oh, Morrowind would be another great example. Yeah. Very strange world. Yeah. Wonderfully strange. The more of those I can encounter, the kind of the more I like it because there's more you can expose just walking around, finding, you know, just little bits of stuff artists have worked on. That's not just, oh, right, that's this thing I recognize from reality. You kind of have to piece it together. Right. And uh, yeah, London is because we associate tall st 
steel buildings, smothering steel buildings. And, you know, you've got this city made of warm brick and cobblestone and friendly curves. And it's just like right. London, London stereo. Now, I've never been there, but the stereotypical face of London is a very warm and welcoming city. Yeah. And, and even even the not welcoming parts, it's usually bricks and like, you know, right. rows and rows earthy. of small houses and things like that. Yeah, it's very earthy. Exactly. And yeah, trying to cyberpunk that up is super difficult. <laughs> That's an uphill battle for yeah. sure. I think I think like the drone, <laughs> like the air aerial highway of drones going by helps a lot too. That was yes. something I noticed when it popped up. I was like, ooh. That is a brilliant decision, both because it gives that cyberpunk flavor, just this constant, you know, two-lane traffic about four stories in the air, but it also has gameplay utility as well, because, you know, it's like, oh, I really need a drone to scout out this area. I don't want to have to walk four blocks to find the nearest drone. Oh, if I'm near a street, there will be a flow of drones and I can hijack one. And that makes the game a lot more, that, that makes that type of, of hacking and surveying gameplay a lot more viable. Yeah, I also like that every once in a while, it won't just be cargo and uh, and delivery drones going by overhead, but it'll be like a counterterrorism missile shooting doom drone. <laughs> right. <laughs> you don't notice until it's too late. An emergent behavior I found today, I, I grabbed a random drone. And it was a delivery drone, and it was carrying a package. And I'm like, I, I don't want this package. And I just dropped it randomly near me and then flew off to scout this, you know, parking lot of people I was about to murder. And I'm flying around, I, you know, maybe do some hacking or whatever. And then I come back to my character, and there's like four people gathered around the package. Like, oh, is this for me? And somebody left a package here. And it's like, the stupid drones can't deliver these things properly. And I'm like, you know, just talking about the curiosity of finding basically an Amazon package lying in the middle of the street. <laughs> and I love oh, yeah. little details. I love little details like that. And there are a lot of them. Have you just ever like, stopped a murder? No. That's a thing you can do. Yeah, there, uh, there are systemic murders that happen where someone will just be like waiting in an alleyway for someone to walk by and they'll, they'll grab them. And if you don't get there in time, well, they're dead. Wow. I mean, I've intervened with gang beatings. I'll see gang members harassing civilians. Yeah, that's another and, similar one. And uh, the police, obviously, like the one they shove in your face constantly is, a, you know, a couple of the Albion military goons harassing civilians and arresting them for no good reason, beating on them. And I think the game is like, hey, you want to kick these sick guys' ass? You want to start a fight? Come on, fight them. Come on, come on. Fight them, shoot them, punch them. <laughs> and <you're> like, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, fine. Like, I'll... I had the shock ability that I was talking about earlier, and I would just shock them. And what I love is that early in the game people will the, the victim will get up and run away oh no oh no and then as i free the burrow and people became more and more rebellious i would shock the 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 military the paramilitary guy and other other civilians would join in and they'd kick his ass and all he He's really tough, and he can give them a beatdown, but if you give them a shock and they get some free hits in, he goes down real easy for them. And yeah. I love that. I think that some some walkers, like uh, pedestrians that go by, will actually be better at melee than others sometimes, too. Like, you can you can see, like, a bare-knuckle boxer on the random channel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can see some people are terrible terrible like comically bad fighters and other times you'll just see like oh here's an insurance salesman walks up joins the melee and spin kicks the friggin paramilitary guy out <laughs> like, yeah i'm not sure wow. like who gets it but there's there's a wrestling move set for sure which is why i was being pile drivered by a homeless guy the one time <laughs> <laughs> there's still so much i haven't seen i haven't seen any of the wrestling moves i'd love to see those so uh, another development question is, was there, are there a lot of restrictions in tone or was anybody encouraging it? Here, 
here's the one thing that really stood out to me is this game is all over the map in terms of tone like you've got one mission where you're going in this dark basement where they're torturing political prisoners and brainwashing people and it's super dark and kind of gritty and you know ripped from the headlines seriousness of like this could happen in the near future and then there's another mission where a guy's like hey we want to rob a warehouse you keep the cops distracted and he puts me in a car and I start driving around the city at high speed and there's checkpoints and every time I go through a checkpoint fireworks go off <laughs> and it's like it feels like Mario Kart and right. I'm like we and I'm like is this was there a tone think, guide? Uh, I'm sure there was, but also I think without like the tone police, there's probably going to be a difference between every pair of like mission designer and writer that works together. And then also the, it has to go through their lead and, and so on above them. So like who, who gatekeeps their, their stuff. And it's, it's hard to set. It's weird to say for a corporate thing. It's hard to set tone from the top because you know right. these things often get pretty far along before someone has to, someone who's really in charge of like the whole project's tone can see it. So it's it's probably a difficult task in a lot of companies to keep the tone. Than something when you have so many people that could go one way or the other. There is of course stuff from the very beginning where it's like, you know, you know generally the the story and things like that. And I'm sure the uh, you know the writing department has their own way of working that out, but. I think it varies a lot between, like like I said, who's who's gatekeeping it and who comes up with the ideas. Because some people just like more lighthearted things in general, and some people are like, no, it has to be serious. Right, right. So, um, the thing is, there's a lot more questions. There's a lot more questions I want to ask you, but so many of them, you, you were, we should have led off with this at the top of the show, but you were bound by an NDA of some sort, correct? And you can't tell us about when that time Bob Ubisoft stormed into the office and act like a crazy person or whatever. Like, you wouldn't be able to, you know, you can't, we can't dish any yeah. dirt here on this show. Yeah, I, I can't by talk the way, that was cut content, any, any production, things like that. Uh, by the way, that was entirely made up, that Bob, it was just <laughs> for people listening. That there, he never mentioned anything like that happening, so... No, actually, uh, that was something I was going to get into when I was talking about working AAA is that people assume, I think, that working AAA is, like, terrible. But so far, my experience has been pretty good. Like, there hasn't been much crunch. Um, I haven't had any super awful office politics or anything like that. Um, I haven't seen anybody, you know, like, have any big drama or, or things like that. No fist fights by the, by the water cooler? No. <laughs> That's actually heartwarming because we do only, you know, th that never makes the news. Hey, office no, environment no. is pretty typical office environment. Office, office environment is normal for game development. I mean, I've heard right. of places that do lots of crunch, but the one thing at least is that I haven't had to do much crunch. Like by much? You mean just like a few weeks, a few nights of weekends, that kind of thing? It, it means the usual of, you know, there's a deadline coming and no one says, oh yeah, you should work on this thing. But it's like, oh, uh, you know, it should probably be done. But the deadlines aren't aggressively you know, forcing crunch on people sort of things, right? Right, it's, it's just, just crap has to get done. And as you get yeah, down to the wire, the last few it was It was worse in, in indie games, right? Because then, then it was like, yeah. you know, we have to get this done, right? We don't get paid until money. this... <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. We don't get paid. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's heartwarming. I like, I like that it's not all doom and gloom in the industry and some people are having a good career. I like that it's not just because, you know, the, the exposés, they're important. You know, I'm not saying Jason Schreier shouldn't publish them, but it, you know, it gives us this picture that maybe everybody's suffering. Yeah, I think and a lot of people assume that every developer is just like working incredible crunch. And maybe that's true. I only have the experience that I have, but it's so far it's been pretty good. But I think the the story of, hey, our office environment is normal is important because it shows look, we shipped a game and we didn't have to work people like crazy. You know, it shows yeah. that, you know, you, you don't need to, you don't need to run a crazy studio to get, get, that's not just how the industry is. You can run a proper studio here. Yeah. I mean, and if you give people time to work on a game, it'll get more polished too. So 
No, I can't ask that either. All right, well, let's ask some boring, obvious superlatives. What was your favorite thing to work on in this game? Uh, I think some of the tech that I can't talk about yet, but was really enjoyable because it was almost the same thing I did on um, Good Robot all over again. It's, I was working on missions for a good while, but then being able to try and prototype stuff is really fun. Like, And of course, it's not like I'm deep in the code as my mission designer position or anything like that. It's it's more about what do we have, what can we use uh, to get something interesting, you know, given the scripts and the numbers and the everything that we've already got. So like I did with Good Robot with weapons or enemies and things like that is really fun. Uh, specifically in the game that people can play, I think the revenge missions, I had to, those were like really not large, but they were really fun to work on. Getting to see like the most systemic gameplay, I guess, playing out. All right. Um, I really like this multiple recruit mechanic. Like this, there is no main character. I think this really plays into like all Ubisoft games should be this. Stop doing your main characters. I hate them. <laughs> yeah. Ubi, this, a, not a lot you. of people seem a lot of people seem to really want a main character. They're like, I, how how will this game exist without a main character? What what do you mean? Right. And if anything, Bagley can just be that main character. He's the he's the omnipresent character that drives the story. But since, you know, this isn't an RPG and I don't get to say what happens in the story, yeah, I'll just play one of the mooks of the good guys. Yeah, it's actually the interesting thing about Bagley is that uh, I think I can actually mention this. But voice acting is a really, really, really big deal in making AAA games, like more, more than you'd even expect because it's usually done outside the studio and that involves scheduling and all the people involved in it. And if you imagine, especially for our game, where any NPC can have a different voice, right? There's, right. I don't know how many, how many people need that same line in a different way, right? Right, right. Yeah, that's one of the things I noticed is everybody has, you know, there's like 10 different accents. And then within that, you've got a variation of gender. So, you know, you've got the male and female with this accent and whatever. So, like, if you write one line, that's 20 people need to come in and read that line in in whatever colloquial way. They're, they're all right. shifted a little bit. You know, the... the yeah. I don't even know what to call all the accents, but oh, the posh... The person that does our posh female accent needs to come in and read this line acknowledging that they escaped danger. Right. So it's it's really valuable for games like this. I also noticed they do it with games like, say, Grand Blue Fantasy. Um, they have voice acting as well, and they have like a house voice actor who they have on call that just does all their main stuff. So it's really useful to have the one person whose voice is consistent, who you always have available to sell stuff, um, and and be someone that can talk if other people can't talk very much because of the voice acting constraints, right? Right. Like if you're trying to pitch a mission or whatever, you can put your your this person in the mission so everybody can see it going it's it's like you can rely on them being there to record anything at any time because you know so for instance uh the i'm pretty sure the bagley's voice actor lives in toronto so he's easy to get a hold of and you can have lots and lots of lines planned for this one person um and guarantee those will be there whereas you know maybe one of the the voice actors for the various other people is harder to get a hold of and they only are available certain times of year or something like that all the schedules have to align to come up with a line from a random person versus the uh, the right. consistent character. So, and I know they do this in Destiny as well with your your quest leaders. There's like the four or five of them, and they're the ones that really narrate the missions rather than other randos of your character. Right. Yeah. Bagley has a ton of dialogue in this game because he is functionally the main character in terms of storytelling. He's the one that expresses how we feel as a team and what's going on, like what our goals are. And so, yeah, like he's just, there is no mission in that game that doesn't require like 10 lines of dialogue from Bagley. And given how many, how many missions there are, that's a lot. That guy read a lot of lines and I'm, you know, considering yeah. a lot of them probably wound up in the cutting room floor. That guy read a lot. Yeah, it's very helpful to have like, uh, yeah, a, a voice actor on call or something. I'm sure, back in the old days. I'm sure for like for the original Deus Ex, 
this wasn't a guy. This was the development team, you know, just voicing NPCs and things like right. that. I miss those days. Right. Uh, yeah, you didn't have the voice actor. You had the microphone. Oh, who's got the microphone? Let me just plug it into my computer and record some off-the-cuff dialogue for this quest. Right. <laughs> Can I, know, I do a I know Chinese what accent? I don't know. Let's find Maybe, out. Maybe, kind of. Right. <laughs> I know an associate producer that recorded vomit sounds for one of the games. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have any, and they didn't want to hire voice actors for it. And they're like, you know, it's a sound effect. It's not actually a voice line, so it doesn't, it's not a, you know, you don't need a licensed voice actor for it. So you just went into the booth and was like, Ugh! Oh, I forgot about license. Yeah, if you're working with, if you're working with, like, actors, there's, there's the guild or whatever. The guild or the yeah, union, you have to work with. You can't, like, you can't just have all voice actors, but then your one buddy who's actually got a fantastic voice. He has to go and join the union before he's allowed to. Yeah, I think that's how it works. But you can do that during prototyping, right? You, you could throw in your own voice just to prototype a mission. Yeah, I think so. Pretty sure. Oh, well, actually, uh, hmm. I'm not sure if that's something I could talk about. It's a cool system, though. <laughs> we have ways. I'll put it that way. Cool. Yeah, the other thing I wondered is if there were auto-generated, you know, the voice of Alexa is just like, before you get the voice actors in, you have that just to fill out the mission. But you can't talk about that. All right. No, I can't. It's unfortunate. <sighs> so frustrating. So I have found Arvind in the game as a character just walking around. Um, it wasn't Arvind Yadav, but it was Arvind Chowdhury. He's 31, born in India. He has Arvind's mustache. He streams Bollywood films online, frequent purchase board games, and is a software developer. Nice! <laughs> nice! And also, technically, I'm in the game. If you can find this, this very specific confluence of all the factors that make up me. But you can find a Zevenhausen, and you can find a Ross, and so on. That's cool. I found a games journalist who was... A, I wondered how deliberate this was. This games journalism... This game's journalist had four abilities, which is rare. Um, like, you know, you'll find a lot of people with no abilities or one or two. Four are, is like your, your top tier people. And she had four abilities and they were all great. Um, and I wondered if that was how deliberately... <laughs> like a specific oh. person. Right. Was this based on a... Obviously the name would be random, you know the the name and face would be randomized but is this referring to a specific games journalist or was it just like sort of pandering to game journalists <laughs> you people are also I, great i know i've seen like a, a specific streamer or two um like stream a thing and, and they're in the game that was on youtube so i know that happened at least once that's hilarious what's one th we'll finish this off with Hey, what's something cool that's in the game that you don't think people talk about enough? Hmm. I think I'm going to have to go with like uh, the the open world systemic things like the murders or the gang beatings and so on, where, yeah, you can see them sometimes. They're obvious on the street corners, but there are a few of them that I don't think people see very often that are just like out of the way. And they actually have like decision trees related to them. So there's like you interrupt them or you stop the murder or you you just watch like there's a lot that went into that that i don't think it's noticed very often very cool i feel like revenge missions might be one of those too <laughs> well hopefully i'll have some revenge missions waiting for me because like i said i didn't interact with any of that i was a very well behaved player for the past few weeks but then earlier today i went on a bit of a tear and i i imagine i made some enemies yeah. Oh, and there's also um, meetings that people can have with other NPCs, and they can actually, like, if you see that they're going to meet with someone and you follow them, they do actually meet up with that person and do that thing, if possible. That is so cool. I, I do notice that it's like, it says their activity is, you know, going on a date at such and such location. And I'll look and, yep, that's where they are right now. And, oh, look, this NPC sitting on the bench beside them is indeed their date. And they're interacting with each other. Like stuff yeah, those that are some of the coolest just, moments, I think. Yeah, stuff that you would assume is just like randomly generated fluff is like, no, that's really being simulated. So this is an amazingly ambitious game. I have, I really do 
wish I heard people talking about it more. I think it's fascinating. I enjoyed it despite my uh, general distaste for Ubisoft open world games. I had a lot of fun with the systems in this one. I hope future Watch Dogs games, just like this becomes the idea of Watch Dogs and, and the team runs with it. I hope this isn't a one-off because I think it's gold. I, I would enjoy that. And I'm really, really grateful we could talk to you. Obviously, we're limited in what we can talk about, but I am just so grateful that you came on and told us about the game. Thank you, Ross. That was fun. Thank you as well. Uh, we're going to go back to normal programming next week, so if you have questions for the diecast, you can send them to our email at diecast at shamusyoung.com. Ross might be around in the comments for this post, so you can you could try firing some questions at him in the comments and see if you get an answer. But like we said earlier, he's limited what he can and cannot say. Yeah, though feel free to ask me about, I don't know, other stuff. <laughs> right. I meant to ask you about the other projects you're working on. I'm a bad host. Well, oh, maybe I have we'll so have you many, on. Though. Right? Right. Maybe we can have you on again later and we can talk about game dev stuff and That'd be fun. projects and unity all right thanks so much ross thanks for listening everybody see ya later You weren't really on the show this week. No, I really wanted to jump in with comments here and there. I was I was wondering at the end if you can like pull a Doc Ock from Spider Man Two and like follow one of your operatives to their date and then just like crash a car through the window. <laughs> I think you can. Like, when I wonder if they leave. Actually, that's a good point. I don't think you can actually piss someone off to the point where they abandon DeadSec by threatening their family. I wondered that too. I've never tried that. I wondered that too when I ran into the I ran into the girlfriend of my drone expert, and I was like, if I shot her, would he leave the group, or would he be like, Maybe. well, it's a tough business we're in. <laughs> Maybe.